So I'll take a look at this little radio. This is the Drake TR3, uh, the latest project, uh, restoration project here at Microwave One. Uh, these transceivers were really uh, high-class units, very expensive at the time, uh, introduced around 1963. And uh, this is definitely a step up from you know, the typical Swan Heath kit uh, and uh, represented uh, a very high class uh, transceiver. It's very compact. Um, in fact, it's kind of long and skinny, which made it uh, almost an ideal mobile rig. Now, we think of something like this as being gigantic today, but at the time, um, with the big dashboards, I know my uh, my first car, which was the 66 Chevy Bel Air, um, I fit a full-size National NCX3 in, and it was at least this wide. So this would have been uh, an easy fit in some of those cars of the early 60s. So this is the AC3 power supply that uh, came with that TR3. It has quite a massive transformer. It's uh, pretty beefy. It's uh, somewhat beefier than uh, you know the common Heathkit HP23 style transformer. It does use uh, similar voltage doubling type uh, circuits, uh, solid state diodes, uh, uh, in concert with electrolytic capacitors. Uh, there's no choke in this particular power supply. Um, there's a warning on the side. It says, uh, do not ship this unit installed in the MS4 or RV4 case, as serious damage will occur. Uh, serious damage will uh, occur to the case. So now that I'm looking at the bottom of the power supply, I can see there are four what appear to be number six, maybe, tapped inserts. Um, I kind of agree that's probably not enough to uh, secure this power supply into, um, you know, the MS case. So at the very least, I would add two more places where we would have fasteners. So we would have six fasteners attaching this to the bottom of the uh, of the case. And I think then you'd be uh, plenty secure for shipping. If, of course you can always ship something wrong, but if you do the shipping uh, properly you should be fine. Well I'm actually quite impressed. It's uh, in beautiful condition inside. Um, I mean, there's hardly any dirt or anything in, inside this uh, power supply. So this is not going to be too bad. Um, I'm, I, of course, I don't trust those capacitors at all. And uh, I will be replacing them with uh, the conventional style they have now, being these uh, radial lead capacitors. These are the lowest cost 450 volt capacitors you can get your hands on readily. So the other thing we are going to be doing is replacing the crusty brown lamp cord that, uh, you know, came with the power supply. Not a bad lamp cord, but, uh, you know, vintage. With a modern, you know, grounded three circuit type cord. A nice gray one that I found. And uh, this one happened to be a computer. IEC type, and we'll just chop that off and uh, put it right through, and uh, this will give us a, uh, a cord for the 21st century. Now, um, when we're working with the AC cords, remember the American standard, the black is the line, uh, the white is the neutral, and the green is the ground. In the, uh, the IEC, IEC, the Euro, worldwide, uh, the brown is the line or the hot. The blue is the neutral. 
and the green yellow is is the ground so so we now have the power cord installed uh, we have the uh, the hot brown going here to the fuse we have the blue neutral coming over here to the other side of the primary and we have the green going down to this uh, lug which is attached straight to chassis so that's what I what I'm considering to be the chassis ground for the power supply the Haeckel grommet worked as is uh, it turned out that uh, this cord had been changed once before but the grommet fit the cord just fine and it's not uh, putting any stress on the cord as a bonus the cord is a lot longer than that original brown lamp cord is and uh, it's going to work uh, with a modern uh, outlet and uh, be uh, much safer than the uh, than the brown lamp cord So it's sort of amazing that uh, all of those capacitors on top of the power supply can now be replaced by, uh, you know, just a few of these smaller capacitors, the modern cap capacitors uh, um, with the uh, construction techniques today and modern plastics um, fit under the chassis completely. And you don't really need to remove the other caps at all and leave them in place so the power supply looks original and more importantly for someone in the future that wants to perhaps do a full restoration with replacement caps that are period correct or at least look period correct uh, they've got something to go by So here's my paint setup. The paint setup uh, to redo the cabinets. Uh, basically, I was using uh, the Krylon matte black satin finish. And I have drilled out the nozzle to give the final spackling effect on the cabinet. That spackling effect, of course, helps with. Uh, you know any imperfections evens it out makes it look a little more professional on the front of the power supply speaker unit um, I've taped over uh, the label so that we don't get paint into that I used a gloss rust-oleum and that seems to have come out uh, pretty nice so this is just the starting point of the restoration of the paint don't forget to wear a mask and uh, plenty of ventilation. Make sure that you have the manual for the uh, radio and power supply before you uh, attempt any of this. The manual is excellent and there are several sources online to get a fresh copy of the manual. Uh, the AC3 installed on MS4 is a typical Drake setup so there's nothing unusual about putting the power supply inside the speaker cabinet. These supplies will fail occasionally and uh, you'll find that the rectifier diodes may have popped. They use some pretty nice quality diodes in this uh, power supply. Mine were just fine. But you can substitute uh, 1N4007s or larger diodes like the 1N5408s if you want a complete rebuild. Uh, again, be careful where you position the caps. I ended up uh, going right into one of them and had to remove it and replace it. Uh, look for sharp uh, points and pinch points uh, around wires and, and capacitors and I added terminal strips rather than uh, using haywire or flying lead connections. Uh, don't be afraid to cut or bend over unused old cap terminals. Uh, add Kapton tape where you think it might be needed and replace wire and uh, resolder where that's required too. The idea of using voltage doubler circuits in these older supplies is completely practical. First of all, it gave you full wave like a conventional center tap or a bridge uh, supply. But more importantly, it removed the need for center taps on the power transformers, high voltage windings. This made them less expensive to manufacture. Plus, the voltages on the transformers remains low. That's also a manufacturing bonus and a safety bonus. Capacitors are and were cheaper. 
Larger capacitor values also made sense with these low duty cycle modes like single sideband and CW, allowing filter chokes to be disposed of. Instead, they just added a little bit of resistance and some large capacitor values. The voltage divider uh, bleeders, for instance, on this uh, unit, 150K. These are not doing much in the way of safety or regulation, so be careful around this supply when it's not connected. It takes a while for the caps to bleed to safe levels, perhaps five minutes, not the two hours or two days that uh, some people suggest. Of course, the bleeders have to be good to actually bleed off the capacitors. Do not take chances. Also, make sure that your meter can handle up to 650 volts without popping or making noise or uh, otherwise complaining. This supply will not be happy with reverse capacitor polarity. There will be smoke. Uh, there will be trouble. Check those connections twice and buzz everything out. So, uh, let's say we're testing right at the plug. Uh, again, consult with a manual, get used to the pinout, uh, connect your meter to ground and to the high voltage lead, and maybe we want to put in uh, temporarily a small fuse like a 1 amp, and we're going to use a variac that also is fused, and let's bring it up to say one quarter of the 120 volts and see what you get on the output. If the high voltage is coming up normally, check the other voltages. If it looks like things are great, keep going, keep checking. Remember that the filament voltage is AC. And the bias pot uh, voltage is kind of loosey-goosey, but uh, at least clean and wiggle that pot and just leave it basically where it was set. They're kind of vague about the exact bias voltage required for the finals in the radio, but we're going to get there in the radio video. Okay, so I didn't have probes that would go into this very well. You know, this, this plug has uh, a mate that it should be used with, but uh, I'm, I simply taped some small bus wire onto the end of my probes so that I could get into those contacts uh, without uh, causing trouble. So ground is on pin 6 and uh, hot is on pin 10, which is the high voltage. So let's slowly bring up the variac and immediately the voltage doubler is doing its work. So I'm only 10% uh, up on the voltage on the uh, input on the variac and we're already at 64 volts. So you can see that, you know, that's working. So let's quickly move down to uh, pin 11, which is the medium voltage. And it should be also 71 volts. So it's a fraction of the high voltage. And then the bias is going to be over here on 9, hopefully. It would be a negative voltage. And we have a negative voltage. So again, this is how we test the supply. We basically uh, slowly go through the pins. Remember, you have to have that short between 1 and 2 to act as the on-off switch, which is normally on the transceiver itself. Okay, so a good test of this uh, system would be to uh, increase the, the variac slowly. Okay, we can see the high voltage is coming up. Take this all the way up. Hopefully the meter will take 650 volts without uh, exploding. It actually will be a little higher because it doesn't have a load. Keep going up. And there we are at almost 700 volts. So here's a, here's a test. Let's remove the input and see how long it takes for it to bleed off. Okay, it's going down. Still at dangerous levels. Uh, the 150K bleeder resistors will discharge the capacitors, but it takes a while. Okay, uh, not even a minute yet. We're down to a couple hundred volts after a minute. So still not into the safe zone. This would still give you a shock at 130 volts. Still coming down. Pretty soon uh, we'll be at the level where 
um, Europeans uh, claim things are safe. <laughs> okay, so we're down to about 50 volts within a couple minutes. So I just want to show you that uh, if the bleeders are good, the supply will discharge itself. Let's just quickly check the other supply. Okay, there's the medium voltage supply. And there's the bias supply. So they're all down. So that's why I say, give it five minutes. You should be okay, as long as the bleeders are good. The power supply uh, case is now drilled out so that a couple of extra mounting holes have been put in the bottom of the, uh, the power supply. So now there will be six fasteners attaching it to the bottom of the case. And that should uh, give a lot more stability. Uh, the speaker will also be installed now and uh, that will help to uh, bring the case uh, into a little more rigid structure. So I think the uh, power supply came out pretty good. And uh, I strain relieved both the audio cable and the, uh, the two power cables. I just put a little P-clip here just to hold them out of the way while I'm working on it. So I, I didn't put any more strain on those cords. Plastic's getting a little bit old from the 60s, but uh, the cords still seem pretty good. I did replace the, uh, the existing cord with a nice uh, three-wire cord, so I used the original Heiko grommet. Just cut down a little bit. And the front looks pretty good. That's been repainted, of course. And I've got some stainless steel hardware on the front. Speaker was undamaged. I did uh, strain relief the, uh, the phono cord coming off the speaker up near the speaker so that uh, that doesn't come loose and you have to take the whole thing apart again. Now the paint job's fair. It's kind of a dappled look and I think that's going to work fine. So off to the transceiver next. <laughs>